Hi, everyone, and welcome to the podcast. Today, I'm talking with Lizanne Falsetto. She is a pioneer in the health and wellness retail food space. After growing Think Thin from her kitchen table into a global nutrition bar brand, she sold it for $217 million. Now she has a new startup, Betterland Foods, and she's set her sights on disrupting the dairy industry. Lizanne, thanks so much for coming on the show. Thank you. It's great to be here. So tell me about, a little bit about your journey uh, to becoming an entrepreneur and building your first brand and your nutrition bar. Was that the first thing you started with or was did it go earlier than that? Well, you know, I think I was born an entrepreneur, actually. When I was really young, my dad used to say, wow, you think like an entrepreneur. You know, I think you're kind of bred to have that curiosity of making change, right? And trying to to grab a hold of it and execute it. Um, I started my career in the fashion industry and moved away from that when I turned 28, wanted to become a chef and decided that uh, you know, for my Italian uh, legacies of, of incredible chefs around me, my grandmother and my mother, went into the kitchen, started playing around, tearing apart my grandmother's cookies and adding protein and better for you ingredients. And next thing you know, I become an entrepreneur building a nutrition bar brand called Think Think Then at that time. And now it's Think. Um, built that business, uh, for a good 20 years and then sold it and took some time off. And that was when the pandemic hit. Right. And, um, you know, I, I kept my eye on protein. I love the commodity market. I find it very interesting. And, uh, when I heard about the food tech of what's coming out with the fermentation processes of being able to clone and develop proteins, that taste exactly like protein from a cow, uh, but it's vegan and the carbon imprint, <clears throat> excuse me, for the planet is better. And I said, okay, I might have to come out of retirement. Hmm. Interesting. So I want to get to that, that, uh, protein or the milk that you've created, uh, through fermentation, but I want to go back to when you said you were in the kitchen and you were adding protein to, uh, different, uh, to make a bar. I mean, how do you go from an idea or making something in a kitchen that tastes great and that you think is very healthful um, and energizes you to then saying, okay, yeah, let's, let's bring this to market. What's the process? Yeah, it's a big, it's a big learning curve, isn't it? Especially when you haven't done it before. Um, so you start in the kitchen, you're at small scale. From that point, I started selling the product to friends and family, right? And everybody kept saying, wow, can I have another one? I want to buy more. And I would come home from a photo shoot and I would be baking for hours until, you know, two in the morning. And finally I said, okay, guys, you got to pay me two bucks for each one of these. I can't give these out for free anymore. And when it got to the point where I could actually stop working during the day and making product, I knew that I had to try to go to large manufacturer. And so what I did is I hired a consultant that was a, a nutritionist R&D expert, and I went through the product with her, and um, she helped me take it to manufacturing, which is much different. When you go from small to large, it's a, it's a different format, and it took a good six months to create the product. You know, back in, in the 1990s, we were making nutrition bars on candy equipment. Hmm. There was no nutrition bar equipment. Today, flash forward, you know, the category drives billions of dollars uh, in the nutrition bar category. I was number four, and there's 183 brands right now that sit in the category. And people are making uh, nutrition bars on candy equipment, and candy is being made on nutrition bar equipment. So oh. the evolution has been really incredible. Yeah, and... And you pioneered that idea of having a nutrition bar. Is that right? Well, you know, at first it just was convenient to put it in your purse and, and I would just cut it into a cookie size slab bar. And that's really, you know, how think thing came about was the size of the product was the quantity of protein. So your body can absorb 20 grams of protein. I wanted to make sure that the product had enough protein 
with no sugar and gluten-free. So the size of the bar was predicated by the amount of protein that I wanted in the product. Okay. So you mentioned two things there. You wanted a good amount of protein, but you also wanted it to be gluten-free. Why are those two things so important? Well, I have a gluten allergen, and I was really doing this just for me because at first I couldn't find I couldn't find anything that I could throw in my bag. And, you know, in the fashion industry, when you're traveling from one time zone to another, you get hungry. And in the airport, there was nothing to eat, nothing. And so it got to the point where I was, you know, when I came back and, you know, flying in an airport through Europe is like driving in a car in LA, right? You're stuck for hours because of traffic. And, you know, you have a McDonald's and you have all this garbage food. But back then there was nothing that I could pull out of my bag and eat except for beef jerky that kept me going, that didn't give me the calories, it had protein. And that's kind of, you know, the whole reason it was, it was, it was born on the purpose of feeding me. And so what I did through that is to make sure that it didn't have gluten. And back then people had no idea about gluten, no idea, right? They didn't know it was an allergen. They didn't know that it can cause, it's like glue, right? It causes inflammation. And for me, it did bother me. And so I was very aware of it. Um, And so I, um, I, I predicated the formula off of my personal needs And then what was interesting is, you know, through the growth of the brand, I think that technology and the way people started to think about nutrition on the go, they realized that gluten's bad. And so we actually were able to segment another category, not just the nutrition bar category, but we spearheaded the gluten category, which drives about 18% of category growth right now in the, in the uh, grocery chains. So it's a, it's a pretty exciting, um, you know, when you're able to build two different categories in grocery that drive such high revenue, it shows a lot that allergens and um, sensitivity to allergens are important for people. Um, how did you become so smart? How did, did, did you go through, a, did you do a lot of education? Did you learn on your own? No. Read books? I'm what do you do? Taught. You know, I was terrible in school. You know, it's so funny because my mom always teases me about that. Unfortunately, my father's past, but my mother would kid me. You know, I, I was a basketball player and, you know, my dad loved that because he was, of course, a basketball coach. So he would say to me, you know, when you play on a team, you learn how to build a team. And it's important as an entrepreneur, when you are building a team that everybody knows their position, what they're experts at, but yet they can dip in and dip out in different levels. And So, you know, I learned a lot from traveling. I was supposed to play basketball in college on a scholarship and I turned it down and I had a modeling contract and I took that. And uh, I ended up modeling much longer than I thought I would, 14 years. And, um, and, And, you know, it was fantastic. I traveled the world. I learned languages. I tasted food. I looked at the homeopathic ways of the way people eat in different cultures And I learned a lot. And, you know, I always say I went to Harvard for a day, you know, I would come home. And if I didn't know something when I was building my business, if I didn't know about logistics or if I didn't know about uh, retail strategy, I would hire a consultant to come in for a day and throw it up on the wall. And I would have a one on one session. And I learned more from that than I could have learned in in college. It, It was just it was immediate gratification of understanding segments of my business. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's, that's amazing. I mean, you, you, you knew you needed specific knowledge and instead of just going and learning general knowledge that you'd learn in school, kind of learning a little bit of everything, you really hone in on one specific thing by hiring the expert that can teach you that within a day or whatever you need in that day. That's right. Do you think that that's something that normal people can do uh, like an approach like that? I I think it's valuable for entrepreneurs to know that you can't be great at everything. In fact, a good entrepreneur knows that either you've got to surround yourself with the smartest people in the room. I like to be around smart people and I'm not insecure with not being as smart as they are, but I shut up and I listen and being an entrepreneur, I think sometimes we get in our own way and we think we know more than we do. And, you know, I've been in the food business now 30 plus years. So, 
you know, I've become quite aware that there are specific positions for people that you bring in to add value to the te- to the team, right? Very much like you can't play basketball without five people on the court, right? You can't build a business without a CFO, a VP of marketing, a VP of sales, and people that cheer underneath them. So um, I enjoy work. I work because I love what I do. You know, people say, why'd you get back into it? You shouldn't be working in it. And I said, what am I going to do? You know, I'm young enough now that if I don't try to build one more, which this brand, Better Land, to me is is hopefully going to change the way people think about food in the future. It's food tech 100%. Well, uh, let's talk about that because I'm a type of person who's very skeptical or very skeptical of new, some kind of new food that hasn't been around for a long time. And you're pioneering a type of milk that is ferment is made to resemble a cow, cow's milk, but it's made through fermentation. So tell me more about that. Yeah. Now keep in mind, this isn't new. Okay. Fermentation has been around for thousands of years. The beer that you drink, the kombucha that you have, the cheeses that you have, um, use fermentation to, to help the process of the production. It's reintroducing a system of how to take science at its best. This is taking science at its best. And what Perfect Day and many other uh, companies have done is they've been able to take a, a clone of a microflora and ferment it and feed it with different pro and prebiotics and build it into a perfect protein. If you look at today's world, the population is hungry. We have people around the world that are not getting enough food. The protein commodity market can't fulfill the needs of of the necessity of protein for the entire planet. We've got the issues with the animals, right? We've got the issues with climate. I mean, today it's supposed to be 112 where I live. 112, Hmm. you could fry an egg. Something's going on in the environment. It, we're getting squeezed, right? So bringing this product, precision fermentation, without having to harm animals, without having to compromise the planet because the water usage is less than half. Do you know it takes one gallon of water to make to grow one almond? Almond milk is drowning. It's putting our it's putting our world into a drought because it, it, we don't have enough water. So, you know, when I looked at this protein, I thought, do I want to get into this? I, do I really know about the planet? And I started researching a lot during COVID and I was mortified. Actually, I was upset with myself that I didn't know the magnitude of what's happening with our planet. And I have two children. I hope you know, to have in the future, great, great grandchildren. And hopefully I'm alive to, to experience that beautiful moment. But I want to be able to help people that are hungry around the world. And so I wanted to disrupt the dairy world. The dairy farmers are in trouble. Um, they're forced to produce large quantities of unhealthy hormone induced dairy. That's not good for human health. And I truly believe that what we're doing is to help the dairy farmers tear off and have an option to be able to continue to place milk on the shelf without hurting the planet, hurting the cows, and better for human health. And so for me, this is a real big passion of saying people should not be hungry and should not be cold. In, in, in on this universe. It's just the way mm-hmm. it should be. So hopefully, mm-hmm. um, you know, people understand that this is a, a milk beverage that tastes like milk, frosts like milk, bakes, and it is the one-stop shop. In other words, you don't have to buy almond. You don't have to buy oat. You don't have to buy this. And, you know, it's not about 
taking away from the dairy farmers. It's about giving them the olive branch to to be able to have beautiful cows roaming in beautiful environments where they're fed on their own time. They're not induced by hormones and creating a premium milk and a premium butter and premium yogurts so that they stay very premium. But yet Betterland Milk helps the bridge to the expense of being able to perform and distribute worldwide. Interesting. Yeah. Wow. So how, how does it compare in cost to a typical amount of well, milk that you would not, buy at the store? You know, luckily it's not that far from what milk is today. And I say that because the commodity market in the pandemic has raised pricing, right? Mm -hmm. So right now, if you looked at Betterland Milk, you can buy it uh, on the market in November um, online. We're going to be doing a D2C campaign to start, and you can buy it at betterlandmilk.com. But you can buy it uh, for six fifty nine, and you can get a thirty three ounce of milk on the shelf for five fifty nine. So we're maybe a buck or two higher, depending on location with shipping. Um, but but what's great about Betterland Milk is that you have a 12 month shelf life. So you remember the old days when our parents used to get the milk at the door and oh, the milkman served the, you know, get, get your milk. So yeah. we're kind of taking that um, approach where you can buy six, you can put it in your pantry. It's the unopened 12 month shelf life. Um, and then if you put it in your fridge, you have a good three weeks to use it. So what gives um, it that long shelf life? What gives it? Yeah. It's the Tetra Pak packaging that we're doing and it's the process that we've made with it it's the same process that they're using in europe you know in the european communities people are used to buying milk warm on the shelf and, and that's a lot to do with the war right and and the battles that they've been through that they were forced not to have refrigeration um i believe that in the next five years you're going to see a shift in foods being served up at room temperature instead of within the um, refrigeration section because of the carbon imprint. There has to be savings that it comes into play and every little bit that a food manufacturer can do to help with that is going to be valuable. Interesting. Can I tell me a little bit more about the process? So you're fermenting something. What are what are the substrates that you're starting with? And then you must be adding some kind of cultures. Is does it happen like in a huge vat in a warehouse? How does this how does the whole thing well, happen? For us, we buy the protein. It's just like whey protein. We buy the protein, it comes to us, and we add all the ingredients. We use all plant based. We make sure that all of our ingredients are sourced all the way down to the farmer. We're very aware of where we're buying our product. We use coconut. And we use many different types of ingredients that are plant-based to combine the same profile of milk. The protein is really beautiful protein. It actually emulsifies and it's just, it's, it's, it's different than whey from a cow. Whey from a cow protein is a little bit heavier, more dense. What I love about this protein is it's airy and frothy. So you can whip it, right? And it peaks. So you have your coffee and in your coffee, you have that beautiful foam. Now with oat and almond and even dairy, it goes flat by the time you're done. With ours, you actually finish your coffee and look at it and go, oh my gosh, it's still foamy at the bottom. So, you know, when you're a chef or when you want to cook with dairy and you want a better alternative without hormones and allergens and we're also kosher, uh, kosher Previ, which is pretty incredible. You can mix meat and you can mix dairy in the same in the same meal. That's a very mm. big deal for the Jewish community. Mm. So um, we're excited. We're excited yeah. about the product. I think once it gets out into the market, people are going to be pretty blown away when they try it. When can we try it? You'll try it in November. Oh, great. You will okay. try it in November. Um, actually, I'm having friends over this weekend because of the three day weekend. And uh, I have a couple chef friends and we're going to get in the kitchen and make dinner every night with, uh, with the product. So it will be a better land milk weekend menu. Um, but I've done, <clears throat> I've done black rice. 
uh, in the in the black rice, <clears throat> excuse me, maker. I've done, uh, I mean, f- you know, breads. I've made cookies. You could make a beautiful mac and cheese. Mashed potatoes are incredible. So there's so many things that you can do with this milk, not just use it um, in your cereal or in your smoothie. Um, I think it's going to bring a whole different ingredient to the chef table. And today's world, all of us are chefs in our own head, right? We all love to cook. <laughs> and it, it's fun to get in the kitchen with friends and and make make food that you can eat and celebrate that you're being better for the planet and you're not compromising taste. Yeah, yeah. For for someone who's interested in being an entrepreneur, what are some of the things that a person can do? Can I can I read a book? Can I learn from you? Can I is it a way of being or is it knowledge that we need to gain to be an entrepreneur? How does one go about doing that? Hmm. I don't. You know, do you remember back probably 5 years ago the millennial crowd came into the business world and they were starting products and they were like, I have an idea and I'm going to go raise $10 million and I'm an entrepreneur. And I'd be like, well, you're really not an entrepreneur because <laughs> <laughs> an entrepreneur and, and that to call yourself an entrepreneur to me is an honor. You have to earn it. It's not just a, it's not just a badge that you put on your shoulder and say, that's what you are. I think that a lot of entrepreneurs are born um, with the, with the curiosity of creating products that bring value to people. And, you know, when you are able to tap into understanding that you want to create products, but you also have to execute, you know, a lot of entrepreneurs are brilliant when it comes to idea brewing, but you got to take the idea and you got to execute it. And that's the hardest part. And so how do you get from the idea to the next step? And I would say that surrounding yourself with mentors is a really great way of learning. Going into a business that, you know, for three months that you want to focus on and understanding the nuances of the everyday and learning that reaching out to people in the field and saying, will you mentor me? Will you spend a couple hours a week? Am I thinking about this right? There's a lot of organizations that help support entrepreneurs. But really, I think I think that if you want to build an idea and bring it to shelf in any way, sort of form of, of a category, you have to be dedicated to make mistakes. And you have to understand that you fail, you fail quick. You don't you don't keep failing, right? You fail and you fail quick. You admit you fail. You don't have to apologize for that, right? And you move on. And if you're able to make a left or a right or a left or a right and be efficient with that, I think that you could be a pretty successful entrepreneur. Awesome. Awesome. Well, Luzanne, I sure appreciate you coming on the show today. Is there anything that we didn't talk about today that you'd like to mention to my audience before we end the call. Oh, well, I appreciate that. I, I would love for everybody to go to woobar.com also. We have candy bars that we've launched under the Betterland Foods um, profile, and those will be available in November. And they are, uh, if you like a Snickers or a Milky Way or Three Musketeers, they're the better for you candy. Um, they have double the protein, half the sugar, and absolutely 100% vegan, kosher, and they're delicious. So check out woobar.com and betterlandmilk.com. Will do. I'll put all the links in the show notes. And Lizanne, it was great talking with you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Take good care. You too. Okay.